I don't live for myself anymore 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 And I don't get no satisfaction apart from you no. I don't get no satisfaction apart from you I don't get no satisfaction apart from you I don't get no satisfaction Apart from you I don't live for myself anymore I don't live for myself anymore No, no, no I don't live for myself anymore I don't live for myself Son of God laid down his life, who am I to hold on to mine? If the Son of God could lay down his life, who am I? If the Son of God could lay down his life, who am I to hold on to mine? If the Son of God could lay down his life, who am I? If the Son of God could lay down his life, Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But they answered, We are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answered Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in Him. He answered them, This is the truth. 
Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son or a daughter, they belong forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed.
into Zion from their freedom came a scheme and why
Hey guys, it is great to be together today. I am excited about what God is leading us in as we go through some scriptures here. So let's uh, get our Bibles out and I would appreciate it if you took uh, some notes. Um, this lesson uh, has, has I think a little bit of substance, some things you may want to remember as we go through this and I think are really applicable to our, to our daily lives. So uh, let's jump in. Uh, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read 14 through 16 to start us off and as we're turning there I wanted to share something with you it's just something that I love I love riddles I love riddles I love figuring them out I love having a problem and trying to determine what the solution is and so um, I wanted to share a riddle with you guys today and actually it's a riddle I'm doing with uh, with one of our brothers so if you'll if you'll just pause here and watch I'm gonna give the riddle and as the riddle is happening as I'm doing this with the brother I'd ask just make some comments down below uh, ask some questions what I would say is if you know the solution don't give it don't give it right away. Let, let us uh, have a little bit of fun. I promise you, by the end of this time, you will have the solution. But for those of us who already know the solution, don't, don't answer. Just keep yourself off of the computer, off of your phones, and don't, don't put anything in the comments. But for the rest of us, let's comment. Let's, let's look at what, uh, what the riddle is and see how we go. So I am with Nick Macy, and I have a riddle for Nick. And so Nick, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. So Nick, this is my riddle for you. My riddle is you and I are, are climbing up a mountain, and, and we see a cabin. We enter the cabin, and we see two men who are strapped to chairs, and they're dead. Now this is my question to you. How did they die? The way that you can come to the answer is you can ask me any yes or no question and I will answer it for you. And then at the end of your yes or no questions, you should have the solution. So go ahead, Nick, ask me some yes or no questions and let's see if we can solve this riddle. Okay, so first question is, are the, do they have any open wounds or cuts? No, sir. No open okay. wounds, no open cuts. They have cuts and stuff and abrasions, but no open wounds per se caused by like a knife or anything. Okay. Um, so they weren't shot, right? No, yes. they were not. Okay. 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 So now climb, so we climbed up the mountain. What's the temperature up there? There's snow. There's snow. It's okay. pretty so it's, high. So it's yeah. so fairly cold. Yeah. Um, and then clothing. What's the clothing that these individuals are wearing? There, I can't answer that. I was just about to. It's a oh. yes or no question. You can oh. ask. The are same they? Question. Are they? Are they? Are they wearing enough clothes that are in concert with, like, okay, it's below freezing snow, like a ski outfit, or are they wearing like a summer or or, or fall clothing, like a yes or no question? Yes or no? Are they wearing t-shirts? No. Shorts? No. Are they wearing? Are they wearing heavy jackets and no. clothing? No. No. Oh, okay. Ooh, so it could be really uh, cool. They're not wearing um, clothes adequate for the climate. Uh, okay, that's very good. That's very good. Um, I did ask you uh, about, is there any water or food inside that you can see? There's little bits of food sitting around on the floor, uh, but, but nothing substantial. Okay. And then color of their skin? White. Ooh, cold. Okay. That's helpful. Hypothermia. Oh. Yes or no questions. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Don't take it. One. So, um, so they're white. They're uh, cold. They're strapped. They're strapped in in a seat. Yes or no? Strapped in a chair. Yes, each chair. of them. Two people strapped in a chair. Yep. Um, and they're white in color. Um, do they look like they've been uh, dead a long time? Doesn't really oh, matter. Yeah. No, yes sorry, or no, sorry, but I'm let's sorry. just say yes for, for the picture you're painting in right. your mind. All right. All right. So um, based on what you've told me, it, it looks like they fell into hi uh, hypothermia. So they got too cold and they died that way because they didn't, didn't get, they didn't get any cuts and abrasions. Is, uh, what did they, did they die from hypothermia? No, sir. Cold temperature. They no, died sir. from lack of water and food. No, sir. Oh, wow. 
Did they t uh, was there any medication that uh, appears that they had an overdose? No, sir. No, sir. So let me give you a hint. Yeah. Let me give you a hint. Don't ask about the bodies. Ask about the surroundings. Okay. So are the surroundings just look like it's destroyed? You're like you walked in and there was like yes. a teen party going on? Yeah. Okay. So, Not necessarily a party, but there was, it's destroyed. It's, it's destroyed. messed. Like yeah. somebody ransacked it. Yeah, something okay. like that. Like it was ransacked. Okay. So how did they die then? Um, they were just left there. So did they? Um, yeah, they got strapped. So they they got left there and died uh, of lack of. Food Don't worry about the enough. bodies. Okay. Think about the surroundings. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how cold is the temperature? How, okay, is it freezing inside the space? Is it below yes. 30? Freezing. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. So it's like a meat locker, freezing. Yes. Um, so there's no heat in the space. No is heat it, in the space. So there's no, oh, no heat. And the cabin is at the top of a mountain. It's on the top of a mountain. And are all the pipes frozen? So the water is all like, because there's water or no? No. no not pipes. frozen. No, frozen but it's freezing inside the space. It's frozen inside the space. Okay. So that means it's not too for long. Huh? Man, I am baffled. Okay. What so let me give you a hint. Yeah. Ask about the cabin. Okay. There's a big roof, hole in the roof of the cabin. Yes or no? There, nope. Cause there's no roof. Oh, it's an open cabin. <laughs> so there's no roof. Oh, it blew up. Did it explode? Nope. Did they, I don't know. Okay, I'm lost, dude. I don't know. That, you got me. How did they die? They fell from a plane and they fell into the roof. I don't know. That's exactly right. They fell what? from a plane. It's no an way! Cabin. It's an airplane cabin. Yes! Not a wooden yes! cabin. Yes! Yes! Oh, man, I am pumped. Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been great having you. Thank you for engaging with the riddle. Um, like I was sharing earlier, I love, I love the idea of solving a problem, engaging with the problem. And uh, Nick and I uh, jumped into that riddle and we're going to get back to the context and, 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 and the, the, the details of that riddle here in our first point. But I wanted to set this up by helping us understand that that riddle itself was, was right there. The solution was right there in front of him and yet it was hard to get to. It was hard to get to. I would say that God gives us a way forward that helps us solve problems, deep problems. In the very beginning, God created man, he created woman, and he placed us in a garden. And a garden is, in, in the Hebrew world, is a place of order. It's a place where things are the way they need to be and should be, as they were intended to be. And man Sin and man and woman were, were escorted out uh, of the garden and, and placed in the world. And in the world, there was, there was chaos and, and sin as we see, as it started with, uh, with Adam and Eve, it went into their children, into their relationships, went into the family, went into the community, went into the city, went into the nation, and then went into the world. We see this evolution and this, and this, this, this sin created some really deep problems. And we know the story of Christianity. We understand what it says, that Jesus comes and he resolves the sin problem. He, he dies for us on the cross, and we're going to get to that. But he also leaves us, leaves the world an amazing solution. A lot of people, when I talk to them about Christianity, go, why isn't Jesus here? He could fix everything. He could fix the diseases. He could fix the, the, the poverty. He could fix the social injustice. All of the problems the world is currently going through, he could fix. And I would say, I would say he has left a solution here. Let's read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. 
It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The title of my lesson today is The Story of Two Solutions. As we know, and you don't have to go far to encounter it, the world is filled with problems. Currently, we have the pandemic, social injustice, racism, poverty. The world is filled with problems. And, and the greatest problem is the, the, the lost souls that w walk, the, walk the earth. And, and to, to deal with that problem, there really are two solutions. So the world puts out a solu uh, solution, and I think the world puts out re some really good solutions uh, in, in, in some cases. Uh, and they use a certain foundation in dealing with the problem. That foundation cannot, can be science, it can be emotion, it can be experience, it can be all sorts of things that they use to kind of buttress up their arguments and, so, and, and guide uh, social policy or solutions. And what we see is that, that there's, there, there can be some success with it. I think there can be some great success with it. But what I believe is happening is those solutions revolve around a broken and sinful world. And as a result, the solutions themselves become corrupt and are unable to, unable to operate and operate well in the, in the way that they were intended. God gives a solution. And he gives a solution that is elegant and, and yet requires so much. And that solution is the church. He leaves behind the church. He dies, he goes to heaven, sends down the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter two, the church begins. And this church's purpose was to be the representative, to be the hands, to be the feet, to be the mouth of Christ in the world, to go into the world and, 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 and facilitate incredible levels of change and, and shifts within nations. This was the intent. This was his solution. The Bible says, you are the light of the world. He's speaking to the people. You all are the light of the world. You are meant to go in. And now, it must be understood. And, and a lot of people assume, well, it, the church needs to be a perfect place in order to do that. And this is what makes it such an elegant solution. The church is constantly growing, constantly becoming bigger, and yet it's, it's filled with sinners. Now, they're redeemed sinners. Amen but they're sinners nonetheless. And so what, what the church, the way the church is different than the rest of the world is by who they declare lordship to. The church declares lordship to Jesus, not to a, 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 a polit political party, not to a, a, an ideology, not, it, it is to Jesus. Who is the one they have given their authority, their, their, their submission to? It is Jesus. It is Jesus who leads the church. And so, if this is true, as broken as we may be, we can go into the world with confidence knowing that, that, that God is going to work and that amazing things could happen as long as we keep Jesus as Lord. So let's turn our Bibles. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Amen? Luke chapter 10, we're going to read 25 through 37. Let's read. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, many of us can go, oh, this guy's wicked for trying to test Jesus. But actually, in that time, there were a lot of people proclaiming to be the Messiah. And so what, what the temple did, because they didn't want to miss the Messiah, is they, they created these little groups of teachers and, 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 and lawyers, and they would go to these people who claimed to be Messiah and they would test them. And so we may look at this and, and, you know, being on this side of history, we can go, hey, that was a bad thing that, this, that these people were doing. But really, I'm not so sure it was. They were doing their job, which was to test Jesus and, and to determine whether he truly was the Messiah. Now, they come to the wrong conclusion, even though Jesus gave them all the right answers. But 
their intent was to was to really determine and 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 be able to figure out whether this person was the messiah so they ask a question and how does jesus respond by asking a question which is really cool which is really cool he goes what is written in the law how do you read it and this is i think an amazing thing with jesus and an amazing you know just example he sets for us because he could have answered this question he could have answered it but what he does is he wants dialogue he wants a conversation and instead of just answering the question he asks a question that creates and facilitates a conversation so how how is what is written he said how do you read it he answered love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself you have answered correctly jesus said do this and you will live and so they're starting a conversation here this is the beginning of a conversation jesus is asked a question he asks a question in return to facilitate conversation they begin this dialogue as this man answers it and jesus goes you have answered correctly do this and you will live now this is the problem do this and you will live see what was just stated and we can overlook this what was just stated he answered love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind love your neighbor as yourself do this and you will live well you know this lawyer it just got personal when Jesus says you do this and you will live it just got personal because guess what came to his mind right as that was being said I've never, I've not done that. I may have had moments where I was doing it, but I have not lived my life completely that way. I fall short. And so, what does he do? He does what all of us try to do, justify ourselves. Uh, you know, he says, uh, he says and he, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, these, are the, the, these were the people the Jews hated, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Now, Jesus says something very similar to what he said earlier. Go and do likewise. See, he, he earlier it was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then Jesus says, you've answered right. Go and live this way. Go and you will live. Do this and you will live. And, and the man's like, I can't, I, I can't possibly live this way. I can't love God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and my neighbor as myself. And so Jesus tells a story of a man that he, that he gives an example of doing just that. And he says, follow the example of this man and you will be living. You will be alive. You will follow that commandment. And so this was the solution, I believe, that God gives us as Christians. This is the solution that he gives the world. And, and too often we get caught up in arguing, in fighting, in, in just simply just arguing about different things that we don't do what it says here. And so I want to put forth that there are two solutions. The solution the world gives, which I don't think is always a bad one. I think there's a lot to learn from it. Um, and, and some of them are really bad. Some of them are really bad solutions that the world gives. But the second solution that, that, that God gives is the church, is us. He asks us to be the light. What does it mean to be the light? It means to live like this man. My first point is definitions. Definition. So let's go back to Nick and I. So Nick and I were talking. I gave him a riddle and, and the riddle was intentionally misleading. What did I do? I said, Nick, you and I were climbing a mountain and we ran into a cabin. And so what did I do? I created an environment, a picture for him. And when I used the word mountain, he immediately thought of a mountain. And then when I said the word cabin, 
he immediately thought of a wooden cabin, a cabin that would normally be on the side of a mountain. I could have said he ran into the hull of an airplane. I could have said that. I could have been more clear. But instead, uh, I used a word that intentionally meant two different things to him. And he adopted one meaning and lived by that one meaning. And this is, the, this is the first thing I think we need to do in order to be a solution in the world. And that is we need to have proper definitions. We need to have clarity in the language that we use. What did this man ask? This man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He was attempting to gather clarity. And Jesus answers that question. I think he will always answer that question when we're looking for clarity. There's a lot of the, pro a lot of the problems in this world are so complex, so challenging, and they evoke so much of our own emotion and, and, the, and, and the stuff that is going on within us. And, and what we need is clarity. We need to be clear. Not just on our position, but on what the situation looks like. And so the first thing I think the Bible calls us to do as we attempt to be a solution for some of the problems in this world is to create clarity. What is the definitions for the things that are around us? So I think as a church, what are some of the challenges? The challenges in this world, are, uh, they all result in one thing, and that's division. They divide us. Poverty divides us. Social injustice divides us. It's the incredible levels of division that occur. And what we need to learn to do is define that division and then become bridges. The Bible calls them peacemakers, peacekeepers. We are to, we are to make peace with those two sides and help to, help to bridge the gap between the two sides. That is our job. That is what we're intended to do. Is that easy? Not at all. Not at all. But we are meant to, we are meant to be just that for the world. And so we need to, number one, be clear in our definitions, collectively as a church, individually as Christians. How do we define neighbor? The world argues on this fact, and, and often I think it's misled because this, this, the, the definitions they give are ambiguous or not agreed upon. But pr that's, the, that's the beginning of our conversations in dealing with some of the larger issues with the world is we need to create clarity with the language that's being used. We need clarity. And so where do we get that clarity from? So the clarity, I believe, can come from a lot of different places. You know, I think there are very many wise men that have gone before us and, and they, they use, they, they've put in a lot of thought. They are able to produce some great definitions. I believe the greatest place, the greatest source of some of the definitions we need to be pursuing are within scripture themselves. And we need to turn to the Bible to get definitions and, and be able to really be unified in, 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 in how we manage it. So what does it mean to be poor? What does that mean? Like creating definition for using scripture so that we can go into the world and engage it. Um, I was sent, I was sent a, 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 a video, this, this, this particular week by a brother. And in the video, there's this man who's sharing and he's out, he's sharing, he's out just living his life and, and he was sharing with us that he ran into this man who was really poor. And so he, he went up to the man, he goes, money I can't give you, but I can give you some food. And the guy goes, I don't want your food. If you have some cash, that would be great. And so the guy says, no, I'm not gonna give you cash and walks away. And in his mind, he's like, that guy didn't want my food. He is, uh, I know what he wanted. He wanted to take my money so that he can go into the world and that he can spend it on drugs and all that. And he created this conclusion in his head. He created this idea and this fantasy in his head and he stopped himself. And this is the wisdom of this man. He stopped himself and he goes, I'm just gonna go back and get clarity. So he gets, goes back and he asks the man, why don't you want my food? And the guy looked up to him he got up and he went to his cart and he, he pulled up, he pulled back the car, the cover on the cart and he, and he showed him all of this food that others had given him. He goes, I don't need any food. If you were to give me more food, I would have to throw it out. And he goes, and he said this to him, he goes, the way that I've had to live my life, 
I don't ever want food thrown out. And so this man, who just a moment ago had drawn some horrible conclusions about this, this beggar, had a revelation given to him. This man was actually more conscious of, of what was happening than he knew, than he, even he was. And he got clarity and he was able to go, okay, you don't need food, tell me what you do need. Tell me what you do need and perhaps I can get that for you. Maybe it's soap, maybe it's a bath. What, what, what do you need? And I'll see if I can get that for you. Do you see how the, the clarity, he, he was able to establish that clarity. It was very powerful. And, and I think we learning what it means to be poor. This man wasn't poor with food. He was poor in, in other ways. And he needed something else in that moment. And this, this, this other individual was able to help him. We, as we go into the world attempting to solve the problems, need to clearly define some of the language that we use. Number two. So we see this in the Good Samaritan. We see him, uh, you know, establishing some good, uh, establishing clarity. What else do we see? We, we see something else. So uh, two men pass this, this man who was just beaten by. And it's a, a Levite and a priest. And they pass him by, they see him, and they go, it says he, they went to the other side of the street. And they, they went to the other side of the street to avoid him and continued on. Now, many of us think about that and think, man, that's terrible. These are religious men, and they went to the other side of the street and just left them there? What terrible people. See, this is what religion does. Now, before we go there, let's make sure we understand what exactly about that story is bad. So, they went to the other side, but what, we, what we've got to understand is they didn't know whether he was dead or sick or what was exactly happening, and they were heading to the temple. And the temple was a place where they were going to service, uh, serve God and, and provide service for the people as priests before God. And if they had touched a dead body, uh, if they had touched some sort of illness, they were not permitted in there for a certain period of time, according to the law. So they went to the other side to make sure that didn't happen so that they could serve God. And so that could seem noble, right? That could seem really good. I would even say that wasn't a bad thing. What was bad wasn't that particular piece. What was bad is they never provided any help. You see, they didn't necessarily need to touch him. They could have stopped and they could have called other people. They could have provided the money. They could have, but what they did is they, they walked to the other side, left, and they never thought about the person again. It was their heart. It was their heart. The priest and the Levite went to the other side to protect their religious service it went and continued on and then forgot about this man. They could have stopped. They could have called others. Can you check on him? Can you make sure he's okay? Here, here's some money. Let's get him to an inn. They could have done all sorts of things. They could have gotten to their, their spot and, and sent people back to go take care of him. But none of that is reported in the story. All that's reported in the story is they go to the other side and move on. There's another man. And this is, the, this is what I think is key. There's another man, a Samaritan. It's, we know the Samaritans are hated. What's the first thing we see? And I think this is, after we get clarity, as, as we get definition, as we clarify the definitions that we're going to be using, what else needs to happen? I believe we need to see the problems. We need to see. What does this guy do? He, he, it says, he, he, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. It was his heart. The first thing we need to do is see the people around us. We need to see the poverty. We need to see the social injustice. We need to see the things that are happening. And then when they become personal, when we see the men, the women that are affected by it, our hearts are changed, our hearts are moved. This man, unlike the priest and the Levite, this man, when he saw the, the body on the side of the road, he was moved. He had pity on him. 
It was about his heart. And that's where it needs to start. And for so many of us, we're so caught up in, in, in doing. We're so caught up in activity that what we don't do is we don't stop and we don't see the victims that are around us. We don't see the people that are hurt and hindered. And we can do that in many ways. We can, we can look at a, a man on the side of the street and go, well, he, he's probably made poor choices. He may be a drug addict. And we're, we don't see him. We don't see him for who he is. Just like the man who was walking by and offered food didn't really see him until he stopped and had a conversation until he stopped and got some clarity. For us, I think we need to see the challenges and the problems of the world. And not just at, a, at this theoretical level, not just at a cognitive level. We need to see the problems of poverty in our face. We need to see the people who are affected by it. We need to sit down with the people affected by social injustice and we need to, we need to uh, hear the, the pain. We need to feel the hurt. It needs to be a part. We need to see the people in ways we haven't before. Our hearts need to be moved. If we are to be a solution to the problems of this world, this is the first part. This is what we need to do. We need to be traveling along when we need to see what is before us? And the Bible says, and I believe the Holy Spirit within us will move. And it says he took pity on him. Our hearts will be moved. Our hearts will be moved. We can do this. But we have to stop. We have to slow down. And we have to see not the problem at a theoretical pro at a level, but at a very personal level. And this is where I think social media and the news does not do us justice. We need to go into the communities. And I know that can be challenging in this COVID-19 time, but there are still places to serve. There are still voices to hear. There are still people to serve. There are still ways to give. And until we do, until we engage at that level, we're not going to be able to have our hearts move. I was talking to a brother, really spiritual brother, and, and we were just being completely honest with each other. And he goes, I don't like elderly homes. I don't like hospitals. I don't like the smell. It just, it, it scares me. I don't want to be there. And so what ends up happening is this, a result of that, you know, internal emotion that's felt it doesn't necessarily engage in those places. And then there was one day where he had to. And I saw how much his heart was moved and how much compassion came pouring out. But it's a decision we have to make. We have to make a decision to go to the places that scare us, go to the places that we fear and see the things we need to see, hear the stories we need to hear, allow ourselves to have the experiences so that we can be transformed, so that our hearts can be moved. The first thing we need to do to be solutions, to be the church that I think provides solutions to this world is we need clarity. We need to create definitions. Second thing we need to do is we need to start seeing the problems. The third thing we need to do is we need to act. In Ephesians chapter four, the Bible says God prepares for us good works. You know, that we, there are good works for us to be prepared that are around us. What are these good works? These good works are taking care of those that are the underdog, taking care of those that cannot take care of themselves, to be the voice for those who cannot speak, to be the hands for those who perhaps cannot move. That's where the job of the Christian comes. Those are the good works that are placed. So what do we see the, the Samaritan do? It says, his, first his heart's moved, he sees him, he takes pity on him, and then it says he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, took him to the innkeeper uh, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. He acted. And I think there comes a time where we have to act. You, you start by giving your heart. You, he takes pity on him. And second, he, he, he takes care of the acute needs, the bandages, the wounds the individual has. Then he puts him in his donkey and he takes him to a safe place, 
takes him to an inn uh, that 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 uh, would would protect him, and then he returns to see how he's doing. What do we see the Samaritan do? We see the Samaritan go through a process that I think is very intense, time-consuming, inconvenient, and very challenging. And yet he does it. And this is what the Bible says it is to be a neighbor. We have to have our hearts moved. We have to take care of the acute needs. We have to take the individual to a place of safety. And then we need to check on them and make sure that, that their needs and their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their, all of their needs are being met. We see that. We see that within scripture right here. This can't happen though, if we go back to the first point, uh, the second point actually, until we see the people themselves. We need to see and have our hearts moved. What did this cost the man? This cost the Samaritan emotions. It cost him time. It cost him money. And it cost him his priorities. He had priorities. He had, to, he had a destination he was going to. He was greatly inconvenienced by at least a day to, to deal with this. Cost him money. He had to pay the innkeeper. And yet we see he did this. And yet, how do we live a life like this? How do we live a life where we can do this on a consistent basis? I've seen many people, they start off strong as Christians, serving the poor, battling injustice, dealing with the needs, helping in such powerful ways. And then they get to a point where they're just exhausted. And, and I would say, I would say, we have, been, we have been brought to the end of ourselves. Lee Callen likes to tell me when I get to this point, he goes, Sajan, how are we going to run with horses if we cannot run with men? He goes, get up. We can do this. And we are intended as Christians to run with the horses, to gallop, to be strong. And this is what, what I think makes the light in this world is this, when we reach the end of ourselves, to keep going to keep battling, to keep giving, to not give in to bitterness, to not give in to anger, to not give in to callousness, to not give in to the stories we tell our own selves about the poverty, about the injustice, to not give in and to go back to the scriptures and be called to this space. And what gives us the power to do that? What gives us the power is what we saw in, in the very beginning. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. No human being on this planet has done that, except for one. And see, this is where the source of all of our energy is. This is what makes us different than just individuals who are moral and who have an ethical conviction. This piece right here, because there was one who loved God with all his heart, soul, and mind, all his strength. And there was one that loved his neighbor as himself, so much so that he gave himself up. Who was that neighbor? That neighbor was you and I. It was us, and Christianity teaches that Jesus on the cross dies for you and I. In Romans chapter 5, the Bible reads, let me get there. The Bible reads, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He loved his neighbor. And what did he give up? He gave up all of his resources. He gave up his emotions. He gave up all of his wealth in heaven. He gave up his time. He even gave up his agenda for you and I. His priorities, his schedule for you and I. So that we could live You and I are the beggar on the side of the street. You and I are the ones that have been beaten up. And, and in the past, different things have walked by us. Perhaps it was relationships. Perhaps it was a promising career. It's walked by us. But not Jesus. Jesus stops. He sees you. He sees you. He takes pity comes down, bandages you up, puts you 
on his donkey takes you to a safe place has you taken care of and says, I will return. And if there's anything else that needs to be paid for, I'll pay for it. If this dude, you know, he orders, he orders room service every day, I'll take care of it. He says that. He says that. That's Jesus. That's what he's done. As Christians, every week we stop and we take communion. This communion is the remembering of what God has done for us. It is, the, it is the source of our power. It is what drives us to continue on without being bitter, without being divisive, without cutting our, our, each other off. This is the source. When we break the bread, we remember his body. We remember the body that was brought down to earth from heaven, the cost, all of heaven, all of the wealth, all of the riches, we remember the blood, the blood that was spilt, the moment where he was separated from God so that you and I could be connected to God. At communion, this is what we do. This is what we remember. And when we do this properly, our spirit is supernaturally replenished. And we go into the world and we can be the light of the world. We can, we can go into the world and be different. Not just be loud, but be loving. Be, be men and women that are sources of true change from a place of love. That's what we can do. We can endure. We can give. We can love and we can watch God's Holy Spirit work in great ways. The world needs the church right now. It needs us to go into the world and engage and give. It needs us to listen when we're exhausted. It needs us to love when we feel like we've got no more to give. It needs us, and we can do all of this because we are connected to the source of love, to the source of giving, and that is Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, as we come before you, as we break this bread, help us to remember your son who died on the cross. Help us to remember the life he lived and, Father, the death he died. I pray that, Father, as we drink from the cup, we can remember the sacrifice that he made so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be cleansed. For just at the right moment, when we were our worst, your son died for us. That means our, our worst punishment, our, the worst things that would be coming to us were taken upon him so that, Father, we could truly have life. Help us to take this communion. Help us to take this life and to be able to go into the world and to be different, to be agents of change. We love you and pray this in your son's name. Oh
Church. It is good to be with you all online again. I've got another child. I just keep rolling them out. Um, so I think I'm good for the next like 52 weeks. We, I have 51 other children here, so uh, this will be great. But uh, if you forgot what he looks like, this is actually Tyler Quist. He grew about six inches since last time we met, maybe three, but whatever. And uh, what we wanted to do is we want to talk about contribution, right? You're talking about it or I'm talking about it? You. I'm talking about it? Yeah. I don't have anything. Do you have something? Yeah. Just kidding. Hey, so I was thinking about uh, contribution, and guys, it's been really excellent. I don't know if you guys have been kind of watching, uh, but uh, we have been really great about taking care of the church, and I know we've also been really great about taking care of others, and uh, if you are still in need uh, as, a, as a member in the church, I know it's very difficult to, to ask for help uh, or to reach out, but please know there are many uh, among us that uh, would like to help, that want to help. We've got the Benevolence Fund, which of course is just for, for anyone that wants to come, but I, I know that's difficult. Um, but uh, there's also just a, a bunch of uh, men and women in the church that, that want to give and want to help and want to serve during this time. So if you find yourself, if you're in need, you know, please reach out to uh, maybe your small group leader. You could also always reach out to Galen Hardy. Uh, he handles that for us. One of the elders, Tom or uh, Sajin. Or you can come talk to me, any, any of us, really, and we would love to help you. Uh, and at this time, we were thinking about contribution. I'm thinking about kind of the time that we're in. It's uh, July 4th, which is uh, somewhat of a, it's a, it's a celebration for many of us. And it's a time to remember. It's a time to remember the, uh, the sacrifice that the country has made to kind of make it all that it is today. I know we've got, obviously, a lot to work on, and we will continue to be working on that for forever probably, but uh, it is a great time to remember, a great time to remember what we uh, can represent for one another and for the world, which is a, a place of freedom. And uh, although, you know, we were talking about just a, a, a land of freedom, we really want to be offering people freedom, right? And that's freedom from sin, uh, freedom from sorrow and sadness. And uh, I think that we do a great job at this church trying to reach out to the Pioneer Valley, or even now we're online, trying to reach out to the rest of the world saying, you know, there's another way, there's a better way, and that way is Jesus. And he is worth it. God is worth it. His kingdom is worth it. And uh, we just pray that uh, today as, as we give and we do contribution, that uh, we can continue to build this church so that we can help others. And that's kind of the meaning of contribution today is remembering what we're here for is that we're here to build the kingdom. And that's within the body, but that's also out there uh, in the world, trying to bring people into Christ's body. Amen? So what we're going to do right now is we're going to pray. I'm praying. You're praying. You're praying. I'm praying. I'm going to pray right now, and then we've got a couple of announcements. All right? You're doing all of them or some of them? Some of them. Some of them. Here we go. Ready? We're praying. Uh, Father, thank you so much for this time. You're amazing. You are worth it. Father, we do this all for you. Uh, I know Megan and the women are reading a great book right now, The Summer Reading Club, and it really Megan's been telling me a lot about it, and that... Uh, doing things because of you and for you uh, instead of just being with you, God. I pray that all of us during this time can be thinking about being with you. And I know that we're getting contribution right now, but it's still a time where we can set our hearts that we desire to be with you. And our money is not the thing that we're doing it for. And, and security and peace or all that has nothing to do with it. It really is I'm trying to make my life and help others to be one with you and to uh, lean on you, rest on you, and have a relationship with you. But Father, at this time, please bless this contribution, bless this time so we can continue the work, your great work, here on earth in the Pioneer Valley. We love you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we do have a couple announcements this week, and one of them is, oh, you got the first one? Yeah. Go for it. Um, so there is a men's midweek on at 7 p.m. Sajin has a great lesson for us. He does. Did you know that? You're doing it with him? No. Well, you're co-writing it? You're the ghost writer for it. Kind of, he says. Next, we have uh, the board. We're going to announce the new board members. I think we've already announced it, but we want everyone to know that we've got a great board. The leadership team loves working with the board. The board really is the, uh, the entity in our church. They have fiduciary responsibility, uh, which just means they're going to take care of and protect the church from making crazy decisions. And uh, that's what the board is. We love them so much for protecting us in that way and being so capable uh, to handle all the financial issues that, that come up, especially during this time of COVID. They've been really handling a lot of policy and procedure right now. 
Um, so the new members again are Barry Molitor, Patrick DeFalco, Becca Strozek, whoop, whoop, youth and family, and lastly, Don Smith. So I'm very excited about those four. They are new board members. They actually are already doing a lot of work for our church. Amen. Uh, next, we have the Morning Brew. Morning Brew, again, that's every morning, Monday through Friday, and then we do an extra one on Saturday. It really is a way to stay connected. It's a way for us to have our ligaments but that is one way to communicate and fellowship online in the morning. Please join us with that. Next week, we're going to be starting a new series on? Matthew. Matthew. Uh, so we're excited that uh, we'll, we will be doing that, kind of transitioning to a new topic. We do pray that everyone can continue to join with us during this time. Uh, so that's it for announcements. We love you so much. The Quists love you. We miss you. And we can't wait to see you soon. Bye. Bye.
King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me brings our chaos back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me What do you think? That's awesome.